Hey there, and welcome to the Vassals of King's Grave. In this episode, we'll be discussing A Hymn to Spring, which is a collection of essays analyzing George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire series. My name is Duncan, or Valkyrist on the forums, and today I am joined by... Uh, hello, I'm Silvana, Silvobri in the forums. Hey, this is Michael, Carl Wadegi on the forums. Greetings, Patrick the Tall on the forums. Hi, it's Sarah, Dr. Blood on the forums. And apparently it's 4 a.m. in Denmark. Mm. We've woken up Patrick, so he may need to have a bit of time to freshen up. But we're all very impressed. Yeah, good job, Patrick. Thanks. Um, so thanks for coming on, guys. Before we begin, is there any A Song of Ice and Fire or Game of Thrones news uh, people wanted to mention? Has everyone heard about the spinoffs that are going on HBO, potentially? Yeah, I heard about them. I, I can't remember all of them. There was like four. Yeah. There's one of them, Duncan Egg. Another one was uh, uh, Robert's Rebellion. Oh, things like that. said what they were. That's cool. Yeah, I don't know that they've said yet. I mean, that those would certainly be on oh, my top just... speculations. But yeah, apparently they're... they're workshopping four and they have four different writing teams put together. And then there's a chance that only some of them will ever make it to air. You know what I mean? But like they're they're kind of trying to put together four at once and see what flies and what doesn't, which sounds fascinating. I see, yeah. Do you guys have a top pick that you'd want to see put into a television adaptation? Robin's I think, Rebellion. I think Dance of Dragons. Nymeria's Voyage of 10,000 Ships. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I, I, reading... Well, that might be a bit too cinematic. Like, you may, might need, a, like, a movie budget for that kind of thing. Yeah. But reading Robert's Rebellion essay in this, I would love to see that in like a, a cinematic form. It, it sounds so cool. Uh, I think George is working with two of the four teams, but I don't know which two because they haven't said. So I would assume those have written material as a basis. Maybe one that's not already been written, like The Destruction of Valyria. Ooh. Like a, a character-based, uh, like sort of like Game of Thrones, just where, where you know everything's going to go up in flames. It's like all these um, Valerian families kind of dueling against each other and backstabbing and manipulating. And then in the background is this sort of looming apocalyptic threat. In this case, it's fire, but in the current time, it's ice. Or like a hero's tale where the Ironborn predecessor kills Naga and stuff like that. So it's like uh, almost like Norse mythology. Yeah, there you go, HBO. We've given you a bunch of <laughs> You're welcome. Years. Yeah, <laughs> that's designed them we know our yeah, shit. Yeah. I, I also heard that they're going to be adapting uh, one of Martin's like sci-fi short stories, uh, Night Flyers, which is something we reviewed recently on Bastards of Kingsgrave. It's going to be on the sci-fi channel. I don't think he's necessarily involved, but the, mm. it's, it's going to be a full television version of that. So this is this is pre-fantasy, um, Martin. Adapt Tough Voyaging already. I want to see Tough Voyaging. I still haven't read that. I should I should try and get to it. <laughs> it's good. It's funny. The Sons of the Dragon novella. Have you discussed right. about that? So, yeah. It's going to be part so this, of an anthology is... called The Book of Swords, uh, edited by Gardner de Zoua. And it's going to be released on October 10, 2017. Ooh. However, it's going ah. to be like the world of Ice and Fire. So it's written by Archmaster Gildane. So it's not going to be like, uh, I think, Princess and the Queen. It's more like, you know, things you have in uh, the world book. Yeah, leftover material. He found a few pages at the back of his couch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it's been read before, it, actually, in uh, some of the cons in 2013 and 2014. All <laughs> oh, right. But this is going to be a compendium of lots of different authors, is it? And he's one of the contributors. Yeah. Similar to Dangerous Women. Yep. Yeah. Oh, well, I'll, I'll give it a read, but it's definitely, uh, it, I'm not as excited about it as I, as I was for Princess and the Queen, you know, way back when. I'm sort of, we need some new, like some prose, basically. It doesn't even have to be mm. A Song of Ice and Fire, even like Dunkin' Egg, some kind of story with characters would be, be much appreciated. Okay, so, A Hymn to Spring is a collection of essays published by Tower of the Hand in 2015, and it features notable contributors from all over the fandom. Uh, if you'd like to follow along with us, you can purchase the ebook on Amazon for about $8. So the way we're going to proceed is basically each host has picked an essay to recap, followed by some discussion. And uh, I'll kick us off with the first essay called Machiavellianism for a Purpose, and it's written by Stephen Atwell. And this essay looks at how characters in A Song of Ice and Fire embody or fail to embody the political philosophy of Niccolo or Niccolo Machiavelli, 
uh, who advocated the use of cunning, deception, and even murder in statecraft. Machiavelli argued that it was impossible for a politician to be both effective and honest. Moral leaders are easily defeated by the ruthless leaders, and so it is better to use immoral tactics in pursuit of your goals and self-preservation. In A Song of Ice and Fire, Cersei Lannister expresses this cynical logic with the oft-recited mantra of the series, when you play the Game of Thrones, you either win or die. There is no middle ground. The failures of hopelessly honourable characters like Ned and Rob Stark seem proof that nice guys finish dead. Yet, as Atwell points out, pure Machiavellian leaders like Tywin and Tyrion have also been brought down. And where the Lannister legacy is disintegrating, the honourable reputation of House Stark still commands fierce devotion. Figures like Walder Frey and Roose Bolton are also seeing harmful reversals of fortune as a result of their treachery. Atwell also looks at the efforts of political reform being carried out at the Wall and in Slaver's Bay. Danny shows more overtly Machiavellian inclinations, using treachery to amass her army, and then resorting to torture and displays of gruesome violence to enforce her will. However, John is also not afraid to lop off a few heads, weaken the influence of potential rivals, and even work outside his oath to assist Stannis in order to further his goals. Overall, Atwell gives the two teenage rulers middling appraisals, noting that their reforms are partially successful, but that the old guard are not adequately assuaged or dismantled. It's clear that power and governance are among the major themes of A Song of Ice and Fire, so I guess to kick things off, I was interested in hearing from you guys uh, and seeing where you fall. Do you think, based on some of the examples in the books, do you think it's better to rule ruthlessly or honourably? A bit of both, I'd say. Um, Not one or the other. Yeah, I I really appreciated um, Alice's point about how you had to link your forward momentum to something that would provide an ongoing inspiration. Um, the, the conjunction of pragmatism and inspirational purpose, I think is what he called it. But the idea that if other people aren't willing to continue believing in whatever it is that you're enforcing either honorably or through fear, then it's, it's impossible to perpetuate it as a single person, right? So like there has to be some kind of sociocultural momentum behind it, which I thought was fascinating. And I, I think it does have to be a balance in order to, to spread that way. Yeah. And I guess the most obvious character that we see uh, perpetuating that is Tywin, who is uh, responsible for extremely despicable things throughout the text, but ultimately seems to be working for some kind of stability in the realm. And as we see instability, even when it's allowed for honorable intent, like, you know, Ned refusing to imprison Cersei's children and stopping the assassination of Danny allows more widespread suffering. I think I feel like Tywin is interested in stability as far as House Lannister is concerned. And then I, I don't know, I feel like ascribing him any kind of maybe altruism is even too strong for what you said, but any kind of concern for a standing system beyond House Lannister seems like you know, I mean, consider it the other way. Like if, if somebody said to him, you know, you could have peace in the realm and everyone would be, you know, fed and happy and satisfied, but House Lannister has to give up Casterly Rock. Like, would he ever take that? Yeah, never. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that, that wouldn't happen. Um, I guess it, he's also working within a particular order of feudalism, basically. Mm. This uh, It's an interesting question. Would he have these ambitions if he hadn't been called up to be Hand of the King? You know, that was what, drew him into this kind of politics of the realm we don't see him 20 years ago maybe he would have been content with just ruling the westerlands and making sure it prospered uh, against the other kingdoms i think it depends on uh if tywin sees the 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 interest of house lanitor directly related to whoever holds the power uh, in the iron throne because he thinks that I, i think he used to have a plan to marry uh well he he does he did succeed in that but he did plan to marry uh cersei to rhaegar right so he has been looking at that uh power uh in king's landing from from the start even before the 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 series began i feel like his motivation to to be a good hand and to rule well and to give peace uh, as you say that's all in service of how it makes house lannister look so because he is hand of the king it reflects well on House Lannister, and because he is being a good hand of the king, that reflects better on House Lannister, and yeah, it all funnels back to House Lannister, and anything else is honestly secondary. Yeah, I mean, I, I think his um, being called to be hand 
possibly opened up a new level of achievement that he hadn't, he wouldn't necessarily, I mean, I don't know if he would have sought to be a gamesman on that level if it hadn't been introduced as a possibility in the first place. But I think once, once that door was opened, he was ready to go through it for sure. So I guess Ned is the first character who we see thrust into this role. He comes from a more simpler sort of political uh, structure, and a lot of his sort of whiplash is being exposed to all of this um, treachery and deceit and spying and all that. And he doesn't do particularly well at it. I think some of it is he's not necessarily capable of it, but a lot of it is just his distaste for this kind of politics. Do you think the uh, reviews of Ned's rule as being incompetent and naive are fair? Or I think I think I agree with you, Michael, that it's it's about balancing moral conduct and ruthless conduct. Ned didn't use the institutional power that he had at his his disposal to its full effect. He wasn't comfortable with that. He wasn't a bit like John, I guess. Mel talks about John not being comfortable enough with power, whereas I guess a Machiavellian figure would see power as important in terms of, you know creating a kind of solid base that people could respect to protect them and and provide order for their lives. He basically put all his money into just going to Robert each time there was a problem. (laughs) Mm. And yeah, that's true. That obviously didn't work out once Robert was dead. So I don't necessarily think it was him being too honorable. Um, I think that's that's a bit of a false argument, Mm -hmm. really. It's just yeah, him not making use of all the power at his disposal. I I think part of the problem, too, is that in King's Landing, the distinction between honor and institutional power was one that he didn't really understand. But compared to his role as the Stark ruler in the North, the Starks, I would argue, are both honorable and the institutional power, right? So that, like, he was... I mean, it's almost like a big fish in a small pond kind of thing. Once there are other potential sources for institutional power, he doesn't know how to kind of conjoin with those or, or incorporate those into a system in which he's accustomed to being Stark and Stark is the institution, right? And I guess Ned is more used to wielding power through those more personal relationships. Like he talks about inviting all of his vassals to his table to eat with him and discuss their issues. And and he goes to Robert and talks to Robert personally. And its power is not as fixed in the capital as it is in, you know, the main kingdoms where you have this ancient family line that is, you know, assured. It's it's engraved in stone that this is the heart of the North. This is the identity of the North. Whereas in King's Landing, it's I guess it's more about partially merit, but also about, you know, how what you can provide, what services you can provide. Everyone's sort of scrambling for for the top of the position. So maybe he's not used to that kind of competition Mm -hmm. and that many voices. Yeah, the power is much more dispersed uh, in King's Landing in the north, as you already mentioned, that Ned probably had it easier because he holds the uh, legitimacy as the ruler. And in King's Landing, uh, aside from the small council, oh, I have a question. Was Ned ever in the small council? Because if he was, then he was he, he would get, you know, the experience of handling all these, you know, little fingers, fairies, you know, all, that, uh, all those uh, court intrigues. But then he last time he met Robert was during the uh, the uh, the Iron Island Rebellion, Balangrejas Rebellion, and yeah he was disconnected basically far into the north. So he's not I think he's not really uh, experienced uh, in uh, doing this kind of thing. There's a mention in Game of Thrones that he's seen Tommen before, um, which is uh, okay. it's a bit weird and it's maybe something that George probably forgot about. But so maybe he had one brief visit. Um, but yeah, I definitely agree. He hasn't spent a lot of time in King's Landing over the last 15 years. And he does, I mean, he starts attending the small councils once he arrives there, but things have taken such a, a turn and, and a new order has been established that he can't necessarily reform or work against. He just has to obey by it. And he, he just keeps running to Robert, as you say. Uh, I think he probably could have been more successful if he just had a, a stronger grip or a more iron rule, if he had of, yeah, basically thrown his weight around a bit more and, and tried to intimidate people a bit more. He was too soft. He was too diplomatic and understanding well, with a lot of these people who were obviously conspiring against him, like Cersei. But I think it was the presumption. I mean, it, it was just that no one had ever, no one would ever do that to a Stark. You know, I mean, Bolton's notwithstanding, obviously, in, in the sort of immediate <laughs> events of the book, but... It, it just, I mean, I think even the other Lords Paramount, there's been more shifting in the sort of 
comparatively recent generations than there had been. You know what I mean? Like that even the Baratheons were not always there. The, you know, the gardeners had been overthrown by the, the um, Tyrells. You know, I mean, that there's there's like this shifting possibility, whereas in the North, everything is so static and so you know, almost deified the start, you know, like there has to be a Stark in Winterfell and it, just the idea even that someone could not respond to him in that way, I have to imagine is, is somewhat outside his purview hmm. with no real judgment on him. I mean, just sort of as a systemic reality in, in this kingdom that he's been, um, or this, you know, sort of not kingdom, but the realm that he's been the Lord of for basically his, his adult life, you know? Yeah. And the contrasting example uh, in the second book is Tyrion, who takes over the role of Hand of the King. And Tyrion is much more comfortable with this kind of political conduct, deception, and outmaneuvering people, and creating alliances and tricking people. But he also doesn't do too well. Is, uh, mm-hmm. is it because a lot of people theorize he was basically just used as a scapegoat by Tywin, uh, which would be a very Machiavellian kind of thing to do, to throw someone else to the wolves, get them to implement all these things you want to implement, but let them take the, the brunt of the blame for it and then step in and punish him for it. But Tyrion, like, he seems good at it. Like, I think a lot of the other members of the small council seemed impressed with what he can achieve. But what do, how do you guys think he went? And, and what do you make of his failure? So Stephen Atwell, again, who wrote this, who I have a lot of respect for, um, what he argues is, is he didn't... Um, make use of the Machiavellian idea of being loved and feared um, because he kind of has this self-defeatist idea that no one will ever love me, so why should I even bother? And so he doesn't make any efforts to cultivate the good will of like the small folk, of the merchant class, of anyone in King's Landing, and he just, he just focuses on ruling and trying to be feared. But yeah, he's only being feared and not loved when a good ruler should be a bit of both. Yeah, which is ironic because Tyrion obviously so wants to be loved and is so hurt when he's not like paraded through the streets, you know, after the Battle of Blackwater and cheered and all that. Like he he works so hard to protect King's Landing, but he never tries to, yeah, cultivate that kind of charm and and generosity that families like the Tyrells do so well at. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess there was obviously restrictions. There was food shortages and things like that, but he could have, uh, I don't know, I don't know what he could have done. Maybe just brought in... Uh, leaders from the community, like business owners, and talk to them, or, or some kind of way. You know, he, he should have foreseen the the, the riots that were going to ferment in King's Landing as a result of the food shortages, but he just he just kept overlooking it, and that was such a big um, strain, and it, it undermined the defenses of the city. So yeah, that that is a good point. He didn't like. I mean, Machiavelli, the, the famous thing he says is, it's better to be feared than loved. But you know, love itself is a it's a powerful weapon, and you know, you should try and cultivate it as well. Yeah, he, he says if you can only be one, then mm. it's better to be feared than loved. But um, ideally, you can mm. be both. So I think, and I think this is where Tywin and Cersei they sort of misinterpret that. Not that they've read Machiavellian, um, but they, their motto <laughs> is no love, only fear. Right? Yeah, <laughs> definitely. That that builds on the point that you were making about Tyrion, where he does have this kind of innate presumption that he cannot be loved. And I would argue that largely due to Tywin's influence that Cersei has that same innate kind of conceptualization of the world and how everyone is just out to use each other. And um, so that the, the, for example, what Marjorie does with the small foe where she, I mean, it has to be an act. It has to be, she really doesn't care about them. She really doesn't, you know, and it's like she can't process that people would respond to her in that way, like that you really do have to be one or the other. And I, I think that combination is something that both of them have, have either had, you know, natured or nurtured out of them by by virtue of being Tywin's children. Again, this is what comes up in the Patriarchy essay, that there's a lot of this is as a result of Tywin viewing the way his own father was treated and the way he tried mm-hmm. to be so kind and generous and amiable to his vassals and how much it hurt him, how much it undermined his authority, how much people, his vassal tried to take advantage of that. And that informs Tywin's inability to tolerate not only laughter but smiling like it just seems it seems like a weakness it seems like a chink in the armor to him so it's it's only fear for him which doesn't seem like a very happy realm like what's the point of having a peaceful stable realm if everyone's miserable and terrified yeah and you see when he dies no one's like no one's shedding tears or anything they're just like no he's dead gotta go to the funeral now and sad 
And that's the other interesting point that Atwell makes, that the legacies are also sort of important because if you're not necessarily working on behalf of yourself, but you're working on behalf of like, I don't know, the state that you want a kind of continuity, a longevity, then Tywin had, Tywin's kind of failed, even though he's extremely good at politics and enforcing his will. Ultimately, I guess a lot of this has to do with his parenting skills and what he's taught Cersei, uh, but a lot of this sort of crumbles in the aftermath and the Tyrells kind of take over and then Cersei lets this, this religious institution take over. Whereas the Starks, even though they're utterly defeated and even though they made so many mistakes because of their, you know, their moral quandaries, there's still so much loyalty. There's still such a myth of the Stark uh, identity in the North that they continue to fight underneath that banner, even when it seems like a hopeless cause. So there is a lot of power in love and reputation because I guess people want that. You know, moral fortitude is its own kind of structure. Well, I think the question then becomes what your goal is. I mean, Machiavelli was arguing for the stability of the state and particularly the stability of a regime, right? That it was advice to princes um, and, you know, sort of how to stay in power once you have it. But if what matters more is your family name and that sense of legacy as one that inevitably transcends the life of an individual, then I think any individual who hopes to establish that by inspiring fear in their own person is ultimately fooling themselves, right? Because as soon, exactly as we see with Tywin, as soon as you're not scary anymore, then you don't have anything left, right? But if his most important idea was that people not laugh at him the way they laughed at his father, then he accomplished his goal as much as, as much as he could have. But I I mean, I think like the, I guess the question, yeah, yeah, the question is sort of what your end game is as to whether, you know, like as to your, your most successful. So is it stability in the realm? Is it something that outlasts your individual person? Is it, you know, I mean, I think these are different metrics that, that they all have kind of ingrained in them. I don't know if Machiavelli was looking much at psychology, but I think that's something that Martin is really interested in. And he shows the toll that this kind of uh, politics takes on Tyrion, and I guess to, to all the characters who occupy this kind of governance. But Tyrion especially, just he becomes so paranoid throughout the book um, as a result of having to constantly watch over his shoulders and anticipate all the moves that Cersei and the other counselors might make. And it seems to just chip away at him and wear away at him. And it makes him really bitter when he's not celebrated uh, after the Battle of Blackwater. And he, you know, he keeps the, the paranoia, but not the actual uh, power that, that used to go along with it. Yeah, I would argue that with Tyrion, some of his best moves he makes are uh, definitely where he's being... Um somewhat dishonest somewhat ruthless like when he poisons cersei and gives her like diarrhea (laughs) Um, (laughs) it's just great um yeah and then obviously when he tells uh, each of the councils his plans for marrying oh god that was so brilliant and he he knows that yeah the spy is going to go to cersei going back to how do you how do you make people love you because Tyrion certainly was dealt a a real shit hand in King's Landing because there was going to be a famine there was just going to be all all sorts of awful things happening I think one of the one of the things that Stephen Atwell points out is like when he uh, arrested uh, commander of the gold cloaks uh, his name is wobbly cheeks that's like slint yeah Jenna slint um, he he doesn't explain to like people why he arrested him. He doesn't say, "Oh, I'm doing this for your sake because he was corrupt and awful." And it's just, "Oh, I arrested him and now he's gone." So that lack of communication and that lack of just you right. know, this public image. If he had made Tyrion's orphanage for orphans in King's Landing, <laughs> like it just be the best seen. name ever. <laughs> Well, I, I think that would have been really good. Like, he should have done things like that. Yeah, yeah, but he, he just never thinks to do it because he's like, I'm not going to bother. They hate me. You know, they'll, they'll, yeah. they'll always hate me, which, yeah, I don't think is necessarily... Well, it's true. that, and it it's also a lot of classism. Like, he mm-hmm. treats the, the small folk with as much disdain as, as a lot of the high lords, including Tywin. With a complete lack of compunction with which he destroyed the shanty town because it was a security risk, right? Like, that... <laughs> It was just kind of like, yeah. oh, they, you know, they had to go. And you're like, oh, okay. It has well. to be done. Yeah. 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 And that, that's kind of the genius of the High Sparrow. Like he sees this body of people who could real tremendous power if they were ever mobilized or organized or, or treated with any level of respect. Any thoughts on characters like Littlefinger and Varys? I don't know if you'd call them 
I mean, they have some some of the characteristics of Machiavellianism in terms of like charm and duplicity and, and things like that, but they don't necessarily embody the more the idea of strength and, and fear and terror. So they, I guess, what's the terms like the fox is the charming side, mm. and then the the wolf is the the strong in, intimidating side. Um, so they have some of that, but as Datwell points out, even though they seem to be doing very well because they, they, they sort of work behind the scenes, they can be undone pretty easily for all of the work they put into it. Like Aegon could be killed or he could, you know, turn against fairies. He could get too big for his britches and, uh, and Sansa could easily find out some of the things that Littlefinger has done and completely turn against him. Um, yeah, it's I interesting, think it's, like, how the idea of the Machiavellian prince and how that applies to Varys and Littlefinger, because, like, neither of them are ever the central ruler or leader. Littlefinger kind of is when he's in the Vale, but, like, even then, it's, mm. oh, Robert is the, is the lord, um, but he's underage, so I'm the, the regent. And when you're not in the centre, when you're not the, 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 the head of the domino pile, you don't have to embody all of these things. You can get away with, like... Right. No one fears Littlefinger, and he doesn't have to be scary because he's just a helper. Um, In fact, he purposely assumes a mask of sort of compliance and, and likability and passivity. Yeah, they ha- they have it easy. They, yeah, that's what yeah, I think. Yeah, it's much easier than, than it is for Tywin or Tyrion. Sorry, Sarah, were you going to say? I was, I was basically just going to say the same thing, that it's it's difficult to judge them by the same standards because they're not technically exercising the power on their on their own behalf right that they're they're behind the scenes and they're sort of they're machinating but they're not machiavellian necessarily right but um (laughs) you know they're not um trying to sit on the throat well i mean who knows what who knows what little finger is trying to have given up trying to figure out what the hell he's doing but Littlefinger may be getting there eventually Mm -hmm. so we could see him have to have to maybe embody the wolf side a bit more Mm -hmm. Um, any thoughts on uh, the phrase in the Boltons to sort of infamous, infamously ruthless houses, who have actually, who aren't actually doing that well at this point <laughs> in the novel, as a as a direct result of their treachery? I feel yeah. they're a bit too antagonizing the others, and it's just way too blatant uh, the way that they, you know, uh, grab uh, and force the power. Like the Boltons, uh, obviously they they should have known that uh, all the other northern houses who's loyal to the Starks will at the end, you know, uh, uh, be against them. And also maybe the Frey will, will have it easier because they are close to Lannisters and the Lannisters forces are in the Riverlands. But I think they, they took uh, lots of risk and it will, you know, go down eventually. Something that Machiavelli says uh, as well is that it's all right for a prince to be feared. He can get away with being feared, but what he can't get away with is being hated. And I would say mm. the Bolton's in the phrase, they're, they're not feared, or they're sort of feared, but they're more hated than feared. Like, mm. it, it crosses that threshold of just, ugh, they're disgusting, you know, mm-hmm. they're repugnant. Yeah. I think the red wedding just went way too far because machiavellian talks about these kind of swift acts of violence like executions or assassinations but this was an all-out massacre Mm -hmm. and it just seemed and it was so blatantly cruel and sadistic and and things like that so it did cross over into that that area of outright hate and it also attacked a lot of like the cultural traditions of of the realm like the idea of guess right and all that so it it destabilizes the realm it creates this situation where you can no longer trust people into your house one more thing um i haven't actually read it i've only read quotes about machiavelli um but yeah the final thing that i've read that he says is never wound your enemies when you could kill them because if you wound them take revenge on you and so i think with the red wedding it was just an underestimation of who they're wounding and who they're killing so you know they're removing the stocks then yeah. they're they're only wounding they're not getting rid of all the the bannermen of the stocks mm. you know a lot of their dudes they either got captured or killed or dishonored so yeah it's not it's not really taking into account the big picture and that is a sticking point for a lot of the the northern lords a lot of their you know sons and kinsfolk were killed at the red wedding they it, it seems like every single person you know obviously davos meets with lord mandalini he grinds his teeth and said my son came to the twins as a guest and they murdered him mm-hmm. so that that's a huge part of that is the wound the festering wound uh that turns so many houses against um 
against the Freys and the Boltons, all that collateral damage. Yeah, there, there ain't nothing Machiavellian about that Red Wedding. No, not at all. Yeah, I mean, I think, no. I think the, the as you subtle. say, like the level of relish that that was clearly behind you. I mean, you sort of phrase absolute joy at what was happening. And I, I think also just the whole driving force behind Machiavellianism is utilitarianism. And, and I think that amount of excess, as opposed to, as you were saying, like a precision strike or, you know, like an assassination or something like that, where it's targeted, it's limited, it's purposeful, and that purpose is clearly perceptible versus just a blood right? That, um, yeah, I, I just, I don't think there's any way in which it could be characterized as, as Machiavellian. Yeah. And, and lastly, any thoughts on uh, the reformers, John and Danny? I mean, John does seem to have some successes in terms of manning all the castles of the Night's Watch and creating a peace with the wildlings and all that, which is good. But like that, that uh, old establishment just continually conspires against him. Like he doesn't adequately deal with them. And he also doesn't really, like he separates some of his enemies, but he doesn't see the, the more subtle enemies like Bowen Marsh. And he doesn't really make use of his friends a lot. Like he, I think it's that idea that you have to forego friendship, this kind of martyrdom. But he could have, you know, used his friends that were so loyal to him to, to help uh, protect him and, and enforce his uh, his authority. I don't know why he didn't. I yes. was actually interested to know whether, as uh, Stephen uh, mentioned in the essay, that which uh, one of the two or both will learn from their mistakes. Uh, so John, will he become a more effective commander? Or and Danny will become a more effective ruler in the next uh, book. So yeah, I'll be interested to know about that. Yeah, Danny in particular seems to have a real transformation in the desert, where she's you know she's having that fever dream, and she's saying you know a, a dragon doesn't plant crops, she burns them. Mm-hmm. She's assuming that more conqueror, ruthless, um, terrorizing persona of her forefathers. And John, I mean, he's dead technically, so you, you should consider his, his reign a failure. <laughs> but, you know, we've got this like kind of this kind of cheat magic thing that, that could resurrect him. And I, I reckon, I mean, my prediction was that he'd just become way more ruthless. Basically, he'd see the error of his ways, that the boy would die, so to speak, and the man would be born. And he would just basically take no prisoners and, and become a tyrant. Like, I want a kind of almost, you know, villainous Jon Snow to emerge. But I don't know, maybe he'll return to the honorable Dower John snow we know yeah um if you look at the novel um the three main protagonists essentially from a storm of swords they're they've all undergone this darker change you know Tyrion starts at the end of storm of swords danny started at the end of a dance with dragons and well, i'm yeah with you duncan that it's going to start for john when he comes back that's just a, a common theme of these three rulers yeah, like I want him to just, you know, just execute all the mutineers, just become like the Night King reborn kind of thing. That'd be awesome. Because uh, it's such a, it, it's such a, it's such a subversion of what we, what we come to expect from Jon Snow. Like I think we need, like it's not, it would be too much of a cheat if he was resurrected and it was just the same person. It's like, what's the point of killing him in the first place? There has to be some significant change. There has to be a cost to killing him. Otherwise, yeah, it seems absolutely. like a cheat. I mean, this is this is George who says that. Um, Gandalf shouldn't have come back in Lord of the Rings because he was the same character and it cheapened the novel. Well, and, and particularly with the precedent of Lady Stoneheart, right? Where, or even even yeah. um, Dondarrion, where I mean, they 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 said explicitly like he didn't come back quite right. So I mean, if yeah, if we don't get some kind of pet cemetery, John, I'm going to be really disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> I read like on a forum post there was a comparison between Cersei and the prince, the titular prince of Machiavelli's novel, uh, Cesare Borgia. They sort of compared Um, that character from deriving a lot of his power from his father and also religious institutions. But once his father died, he struggled to, to maintain that power, which is kind of what you see with Cersei. She takes a lot of influence from her father, but she can't, um, continue it on into her own reign she can't assert her own level of power she derives it all from her family name but not her own force of personality and then the the religious <laughs> institutions which originally help her sort of turn against her and end up being her undoing i mean it's, it's strange to say but i feel like i'm i'm very interested in the issue of cersei and gender obviously as cersei also is but <laughs> um i i think that it's very interesting to consider the fact that once tywin is dead she she sees herself and kind of fashions herself as 
um, finally being able to frame herself as the patriarch in a lot of ways. And I mean, they call her, you know, sort of Megor with mm-hmm. teats. And I, I think that she sees it or, or uses it in practice as an opportunity to shed the lessons that she has been forced to learn as a woman working in this system. And I mean, the sort of most blatant example of what those lessons would be or what she you know, bestows her wisdom upon Sansa with, you know, the weapon between her legs and things like that. But then her, her complete divestiture of all of those strategies that she has been using thus far, once she, she is free of Tywin or, or, you know, sort of, imagines on some level herself to be free of time and that she's free to be Tywin, which I think is her biggest mistake. A lot of, a lot of people oh, okay. misinterpret cool. Machiavellianism. That's what I have to say. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, that's probably true, but I still, I'm still not really a fan of it. It seems to advocate fascism. Like, it's like, here's, a, here's how you can achieve an ordered state, but you have to be, be okay with a few assassinations and, and being really ruthless. Like, I don't really like yeah, that. Yeah, but it's good fascism, you know? I'm sure. I'm sure in the history no, of no. society. <laughs> <laughs> to be like, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to pass on that. Thanks. I mean, I think. I think the problem is, as you say, I think part of it is that we have a sense of the kind of Richard the Third filtered Machiavellianism, right? Where he's saying, "I'm going to set the murderous Machiavell to school," and it's not. It's not, you know, carving your way to your goals through whoever gets in your way. Like there's there's much more um, subtlety to it and there's much more of a balance to it as it's practically advised in the philosophy. But um, but yeah, I do think the emphasis on um, stability above above all else and particularly stability invested in the person of the prince is is one that easily becomes very disconcerting for sure. Yeah. And in that way, I think. Stannis sort of embodies some of the more positive sides of that. He's certainly not charming, but as we see in the later essay or the essay we're about to go to, his his flexibility um, is significant in, in some of the power he's able to amass. And I guess Davos is he's got a moral core, but he's about he sort of knows how the world works, and he applies some of that pragmatism and some of that realism that Ned wasn't able to mm-hmm. to the way he um, the way he channels power and, and tries to temper his some of his king's more. Uh, outlandish proposals um, <laughs> but let's uh let's move on silvana would you like to tell us about the next essay okay the next essay is titled iron bands written by jeff hartline who's also known as brindan beefish um so it basically uh lights a lot of um facts about stannis but also the argumentation uh, about Stannis being hard and unyielding, but he is actually pragmatist when he's needed. He started the essay with uh, some of the point of view characters' views on Stannis, uh, the noble ones and also small folk. Uh, one of the main example is that, of course, Donald Noyce quote on Stannis uh, being brittle and that he would break before he bends. And then Jeff uh, laid out his argumentation that actually that's not the case. So he quoted uh, the story about Stannis adoption of a ghost hawk called Proudwing, which actually uh, I think it shows uh, Stannis' idealistic side and then his realization that the bird is not particularly useful. And he got mocked uh, by Robert and I think one of his uncles because he li- he loves that uh, ghost hawk so much. And then he decided that he needed to try a stronger hawk. So he adjusted, he adapted. Uh, the stronger hawk in this case means uh, the red hawk, uh, i.e. Uh, the lore. Which brings the discussion, the discussion to Stannis' conversion to the lore, which is very pragmatic. He saw the benefit. The red god is uh, already a trendy religion in Westeros. It's gaining lots of traction. Uh, and he actually did not really force people to convert. So we might say, or we might argue that he's not a real fanatic in that. And I also like the fact that um, Jeff made a, quite a few description on uh, Stannis' three notable counselors because, uh, well, he bends because he also have advice from other people. So Stannis actually listened to people's advice. So we have Mel, she's a woman, we have Davos from the small folk, and we have John, a bastard. So that's not, uh, you know, traditional advisors, I think, for Westerosi rulers. And he also uh, discussed a bit about um, Stannis' strategy in making allies. 
One of the main examples is that he made a change of tactics based on John's advice, in which he asked for filthy, not commanding people who hardly know him. So yeah, uh, I really like the essay a lot because it some of the facts are you know spread around the books, and you heard a lot of about people, even uh, Davos himself as his advisor, saying Stannis is hard. Uh, it's a hard man. Uh, he's just, but he's just, you know, he can't bend. So the essay uh, is very insightful, and I think anyone who thinks that, oh, Stannis is just, a, you know, not a very good character should really read this essay, because, yeah, it will give you uh, a notion that probably he's not. Yeah, I actually think it's a really convincing essay. Like, it shows all of the different ways that Stannis is actually quite flexible. And one of the things I think people like about him as a ruler is that he actually takes advice from a lot of people. He doesn't have this single-minded, I mean, he has the goal, but he, he doesn't have a fixed way on how he's going to achieve it. And he's open to other possibilities. And he's, his counselors, as you say, Silvana, aren't necessarily based on their birth. They're based on their utility, their sort of uh, merit to him and what they can achieve and, and their demonstrations of loyalty to him. So actually, yeah, I agree. Like, if you after you read this essay, you you have a bit more uh, fondness and respect for Stannis. Yeah, I, I definitely feel that that initial statement that Donald Noy makes: uh, Renly's copper, Robert is steel, Stannis is iron. Um, it's a good way to introduce us to these three characters because I think it's made at the start of the Clash of Kings, and I think there is some truth to that. Like on at one level, there is a part of Stannis that is iron, in that he will never ever submit to Joffrey or Tommen or the Lannisters because they're they're bar- incestuous bastards. He will never give up. But I feel that you can't just reduce him to that single sentence. Mm-hmm. Like there's a lot more to him than that. Yeah, you can't reduce people to a single sentence. That's a good point. <laughs> He's not just one uh element of the periodic table. <laughs> <laughs> He's made up of carbon and oxygen and nitrogen, you know? <laughs> And Donald Noy is a Robert's fanboy, I think. Yeah, <laughs> he, he's the one who true. made the, what is it, the, his Warhammer. So mm-hmm. he's probably really, really biased when he said that. And, and Noy's talking about how he knew them as children, because obviously Robert has changed a lot. Like, I don't think he would be have as much affection for Robert if he saw him today. Yeah, he's definitely a lot squishier than Steel usually is, for sure. Yeah, he's a bit melted. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> So I was wondering uh, if Donald Noy is still alive when Stannis arrived at the wall, would, would he change his mind? I think he would. I think he would too. I think. I really wish we could have seen yeah. that. Uh, yeah, that would have been interesting. Well, I think the point is that Stannis is going through a transformation through these books. So the person he starts out as, the man he was under Robert, was different from the person he is at the beginning of book two he suffers a defeat that humbles him that forces him to reassess uh, who he is and his methods Um, and then his ultimate decision to go to the wall is obviously a a big decision where he's deciding not to focus on his rights and what's owed to him but his responsibility Mm. uh, as an actual king what does a king actually do Um, and I had actually completely forgotten about this whole proud wing speech in the first Davos chapter. I was surprised to read it. It's a really good speech because, you know, Davos has only got three chapters and two of those chapters are like some of the best chapters in the book, the Siege of Storm's End and the attack on King's Landing. But this one, not so much happens apart from the burning of the idols. But this this speech seems really important because it's a lot of it seems to be that he's always been the dutiful brother and the dutiful subject but now he wants to take control and now he wants his voice to be heard or something like that. And hes it's obviously taking it down a very dark path because he says, I'm going to try a different hawk, a red hawk. But he's not really a fanatic. Like he, he, he seems to be an atheist in the beginning, but he's okay with trying out this different tactic, I guess because it inspires terror, so maybe he's taking on that more Machiavellian vibe. <laughs> but um, but he, he transforms over the books uh, how much a, a of how much do you think that his going along with Melisandre's idea that he is Azor High is a tactic on his part or just a transference of his customary dutifulness to someone else's conception of who he is? Like is it just a more appealing narrative that someone has constructed for him or is it is he actually kind of 
Yeah, initially, I think he's using it as like propaganda, I guess. Like she can inspire mm-hmm. terror into the hearts of men, and she's. But also, it is that thing where he's been constantly belittled and never got what he's due. So this narrative that he's sort of this chosen warrior king is very appealing, and you can see as Melisandre's power gets more and more demonstrated, he starts to buy more and more into that. Um, it gets smashed a bit after the Battle of Blackwater yeah. and he starts to you know, go through an identity crisis and has to reinvent himself. But uh, in book five, he's quite flexible in terms of he's taking uh, advice from Jon Snow. He offers to legitimize Jon Snow mm-hmm. um, to take Winterfell. So he's more practical. He knows, he's, I think he's, he's, he's learned a lot from Davos that it's great to have ideals and overarching goals, but you have to actually look at the chessboard. You have to look at your situation and, and understand how, how the world works. Mm-hmm. And John gives some good advice, I think, where he says, you can't just command people to be your followers. You have to actually go and talk to them and show them your face. And, and um, I, have, I have pretty high hopes for Stannis. I think he's like, his star is rising. I can't see him losing the Battle of Winterfell. He just seems to have amassed such a diverse coalition of followers. And he, he commands, even though he's got all of these things working against him, every, everyone says he's charmless and a bore and he'd make a terrible king. He seems to, he's like military strength and his re- resolve and his belief in the rule of law attracts a lot of people, especially in these kind of, you know, uncertain times. Yeah, you mentioned about the Battle of Ice. So I think uh, Stannis' um, military commandership is also showed his uh, adaptability. He's been fighting in a lot of, you know, uh, situations. So he was uh, defending Storms and he was uh, basically defeating um, Victorion, who's one of the best or if not the best admirals in uh, Westeros. And he also, uh, in the Winds of Winter, we're going to see Stannis... Uh, implementing the guerrilla warfare um, and you know uh, I don't know whether we can talk <laughs> the, the spoiler chapter series but I think we're going to see him having a lot of things uh, you know on, on his sleeves and then adapting to the terrain as well as the people as well as his enemies uh, so yeah uh, yeah looking forward to more uh, Stan- Stannis' awesomeness in the next books yeah, I can't see him losing. Like, it's just too much of a build-up, and it would be too much of a letdown if he, he were to lose the Battle of Winterfell. And I don't see yeah. those clues like they were for the Red Wedding, where there's like something is conspiring against him. Uh, apart from the weather, obviously, or you know, he could just lose the battle. But it just seems like I don't know. He just like seems so confident that he'll defeat the Boltons, and the Boltons are having such a hard time. Like they've got all these enemies within the castle. If Stannis attacks the castle, I can't see how the Northern wouldn't rise up against the Boltons the Stannis that we see in the show is very different from the Stannis mm-hmm. in the books because the Stannis in the show is a fanatic. Yeah. He burns non-believers. And yes, he burns people in the books, but it's a punishment for you know cannibalism and various crimes. Just however you would uh, you know, punish trade. them and we're yeah, opting to do it. It's just fire. one method of execution, but he's not burning unbelievers. He's actually, again, to, to go to his flexibility, he's actually quite religiously tolerant. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also one thing I'd like uh, to know your opinion about is that would Stannis make a better monarch than Danny? Um, Littlefinger said that if Stannis were to sit on the Iron Throne, then the realm would bleed. So would the realm bleed more under Stannis? Uh, because I think the realm's already bleeding. Exactly. I mean, regardless, you know, it's Stannis or not. Um, I think under him, the ones bleeding would be, you know, the, the people who he considers as to be traitors. But he also showed that himself that he could, you know, have mercy and, and give pardons when it's needed. Like, you know, the, the ones who was, um, defend, uh, sorry, uh, was in Renly's forces. So, and Danny, well, as you mentioned, that he sees all about uh, blood and fire. He, he, will, he will be more, much more ruthless. And he actually crucified innocent people. So I think, yeah. Maybe not. I feel like the bloodshed could potentially be equivalent, but the groups of people bleeding would be radically different. So it's like just uh, uh, bleeding, but uh, more just. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I don't, or, or at least, you know, more sort of justified, at least. I mean, you know, whether or not that makes it just, I don't know, but that she would go wholesale for entire houses, I feel, and, you know, kind of almost like a Reigns of Castamere sort of thing for anyone that had killed her father, betrayed her throne, or, you know, whatever list Viserys, I'm sure, had Arya style as he went to sleep at night. <laughs> but but I think Stannis would be much more 
precise, it, it, almost in the in the very Machiavellian sense that we were talking about, that it would be much more targeted. It would be much based on individual um, transgressions or or kind of things that he deemed unacceptable. Yeah, he has a couple of lines where it's like, to be lordly is to be false. I've learned that. And when Davos is like, oh, you can't make me the hand, the lords won't accept it. He's like, well, then we'll make new lords. <laughs> and it, it just makes, I really want to see him on the Iron Throne just to see how many people's heads he chops off. Because like, yes, they all deserve it. I think we should start a Danis no, but... ship. Just have them get married and <laughs> clean house. <laughs> Can you um, imagine how long the trial will be? <laughs> it's like a year well, long. I mean, that's the other thing I think the essay points out, that Stannis, you know, the notoriously unmerciful Stannis, can actually be merciful. He, he can pardon people if they admit their guilt. Um, so he is very, as harsh as he is in disposition, his, his uh, quality of justice is the punishment has to fit the crime. So I think it's going to be a more measured response if he were to ascend to the throne than Danny, who you know we've already seen commit quite heinous massacres against you know, in, indiscriminately. Mm-hmm. Now that she's assumed this more conqueror persona, unless you know everyone rallies to her cause, I predict tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people being burnt alive as a result of her taking the throne. So I, I think. Um, the state that Westeros is in, it's already suffered so many casualties, suffered so much death. I think I think Stannis is the better bet for the realm at this point um, because he takes a more measured approach. But um, I wonder what Stannis' uh, response to Danny would be. Like, would he still assume he's the king by right of conquest or, or would he have to kneel to the Targaryen's heirs? Well, we're going to see it because we know via prophecy that they have to meet and... Daenerys will be Doing? slayer of lies for Stannis. So, yeah. Which prophecy is that? In the in the House of Undying, um, Danny gets called Mother of Dragons, Slayer of Lies, and then she sees a king with a red sword and blue eyes who casts no shadow. All right, because he's he's a false Azor Ahai. Yeah, basically. True. Yeah. So yeah. Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> Sorry, I just uh, came in. But oh, hey, Patrick. Patrick, a wild Patrick's appeared. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, or it could be uh, reanimated John, you know, being seen uh, as the new new sword high, having a flaming sword and uh, and blue uh, eyes, blue eyes because he's reanimated. Mm. Uh, I think uh, if Danny can prove to Stannis that she is just demonstrating more value in defending the realm, I'm taking uh, Jeff's line here. Then probably Stannis will say, "Oh yeah, okay, you're the rightful ruler because you can." Defending the realm better than I do. Really? Maybe. I don't think. I don't think Stannis is that uh, rational. It depends on what the threat is. If the threat is the others, maybe he will throw his lot behind Danny because she has dragons. Mm. I'm thinking that this actually might be where the ironness of Stannis will rear its head, and like when faced with the awful, awful truth that he's not Azor Ahai. Yeah, I don't know actually. I don't know, but yeah, it'll be it'll definitely be an interesting reaction from Stan. We all agree that he isn't, though, right? I mean, yeah. really? Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I, I hope. I so hope we see Stannis facing off against the others, <laughs> and the others just like fleeing before. Him. Oh no. <laughs> yeah, uh, there's lots a lot of people thinking that he might survive to the end game, or uh, even become like real king and. A se- there's even people who are talking about Stanza, uh, no, Stanza no. and Stannis. Uh, Stanny, uh, oh, Stanny, so all the way. Man. No. Or, or, <laughs> or Stanny? Yeah, okay, that's, well, my new, I, that's my new ship. Okay, okay well, <laughs> I, I, I support neither of those. Uh, and uh, for the simple reason that, that Stannis has now divided himself at least to fighting the others he sees that as at least a black and white situation right and i think he feels more comfortable in knowing specifically who his enemy is which is why he he won't make a, a good king ever mm-hmm. because he mm-hmm. <laughs> because he, he's he would make a good counselor as he has done before yeah but uh never a good king uh, just some people who thinks that he would make, uh, uh, you know, a Night Watch commander. Thousand. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. He's, he seems so comfortable in that um, uh, military position um, that he would, he'd be the good front line against the others. He'd whip the wall into shape. <laughs> 
I hope he doesn't get a sad ending. I want him to have like, I don't want him to like die. I just want a mediumly happy ending for him. Dennis. Yes. He must go to the holds of Valhalla. A true and honored warrior. Yeah, Davos. Davos cradling him in, oh, in his arms as he dies and touching his cheek and saying, my onion knight. <laughs> Farewell, my onion knight. Oh. Ooh, Stannis Zingers. I can see that. Oh. Um, <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, which one is your favorite? Ah, oh, there's so many. Hold on, I gotta, gotta, gotta think about this. Mine would be his quote about uh, Robert. He says that uh, I'll need to take a page from my brother's book. Not that he ever read one. <laughs> <laughs> He's so Saladin He's from Big Bang Theory. He's got such a such a great dry humor. <laughs> Oh, when he's when he's talking about the incest, he's like, um, Gilly has to leave here, you know. This isn't King's Landing. Where you can just teach <laughs> incest babies. <laughs> Eat your heart out, the wit and wisdom of Tyrion Lannister. I would pay money for the wit and wisdom of Stannis. Oh, Bacchus. hell yeah. For sure. And the one with Renly. Uh, Renly said, you'll be pleased to know about Marjorie. You'll be pleased to know she came to me a mate. And then Stannis replies, in your bed, she's like to die that way. So he's, he's like the king of put downs. <laughs> it's like Jerry Springer. <laughs> and I like his little grammatical corrections. Yeah, that's, that's definitely my favorite, like, for sure. When he says fuel. Yeah. <laughs> if, um, if Maggie the Frog's prophecy comes true and Marjorie and Tommen die, does that mean Stannis is king by default? Or is he just considered a, a traitor or a rebel to the realm and, and not eligible? If he's been officially attainted, whatever that means, um, I think that's something you could do. You strip them of title and yeah, you yeah you write a decree and then Tommen puts a seal on it, um, which I think has been done. It's just a so picture of a kitten, <laughs> <laughs> a kitten doodle. <laughs> uh, Michael, would you like to tell us about your essay? All right, so this is how to win thrones and rule people. Um, oh, damn it! I did, who who wrote this one? I, I really should. There's a link in yeah, the, I'm just on the thread. Scrolling. Oh, shit. I'll see if I can find it. Um, yeah. Anyway, it it examines um, the end of the Targaryen dynasty, obviously Robert's rebellion. Oh, by Jim McKeehan. That's who wrote it. Um, and it basically asks. Uh, why was it this rebellion that was able to unseat the Targaryens? What were the crucial things that happened in this one that didn't happen in the others? Because as we all know, there's been rebellions against the Targaryens before, but this one was successful where all the others failed. Um, so it basically charts what was happening in Robert's rebellion and basically how Aerys was responding and how Robert was the ultimate commander. So basically, first point I want to bring up is it, this made me realize that Aerys II is what I would call the worst king of uh, of the Targaryens. Because um, usually when I was thinking of who's the worst king, I usually go Aerys the Mad, Aegon the Unworthy, and Mega the Cruel. And I can never really get it down to any of those into one. But yeah, this one made me realize that, you know, unlike Mega the Cruel, who had a rebellion against him, that was, it was, we want to replace you with another Targaryen, you know, Jaehaerys, and then with Aegon the Unworthy and his rebellions, it was, we want to replace you with a Blackfire, who's essentially a Targaryen. But Aerys was so unpopular, and he had the ability to drive away so many allies that it, this rebellion ended up being, we want to replace you with not a Targaryen, no more Targaryens. And he was able to inspire such an anti-Targaryen uh, demeanor. So, yeah. What do you guys think of Eris? Well, he's he's a sucky leader, of course. That's no denying that. I mean, every time we do the Targaryen uh, cast, we definitely mes- mention him as one of the worst. But I don't feel like he's the worst because the situations that like perpetuated his rule to be the uh, catastrophic one sort of was out of his hands from like hundreds of years ago so that's Q yeah yeah obviously he didn't have dragons so he couldn't um and they do mention that oh in the first 100 years or so the Targaryen rule was that much more solid and firm 
And once the dragons are gone, um, it seemed that sooner or later there would be a rebellion that would get rid of the Targaryens. Yeah, I think, Sarah, you might have mentioned this on the last reread, mm. but the Targaryens have slowly lost this status of gods mm -hmm. over the hundreds of years, and the first major one was losing the dragons, these kind of uh, you know, war machines that could settle any score. And slowly they've been whittled away. They've been proven to be poor rulers and weak rulers and uh, prone to all the vices of normal humans. They've been outwitted by the other sort of Andal lords. Um, they've intermarried. They've lost that idea of sort of the pure, you know, mm -hmm. Targaryen gene. And the image that Ares presents, you know, not only is it crazy and cruel and, and all that, it's just kind of pathetic. Like when people looked at him, they just saw this haggard, long-nailed old man. Um, so that didn't inspire this sense that this is the person who had to rule the whole realm. So the, I guess the Targaryens had just been reduced to another sort of kingdom or another family mm -hmm. on par with the Starks or the Lannisters, <laughs> so they could be supplanted. Well, one of the things that I, and it, it was me that pointed it out with the Jamie chapter, but um, it, my interest in that is that it does seem historically that there was this sort of precipitous decline first with the loss of the dragons and then just yeah into this kind of no longer um exotic on a certain level i think they lost a, a a mystique or an exoticism when they lost the the purity of the targaryen features um but what was very interesting to me is that jamie still characterizes um the the freedom from the prohibition as incest as one that was going to put the Lannisters on par with gods and Targaryens, like that they were still closer to that category of divinity, even with this precipitous decline. And I mean, I think that's one of the things that I find most interesting about Robert's Rebellion is like, whereas I can see from, from the demystification angle, why they would have seemed more replaceable at that point, particularly with Eris being who Eris was. Um, but I, I also think it's very interesting that they had such a prime candidate for the restoration of the Targaryen mystique with Rhaegar and that it went so radically the other way where, you know, I mean, the, the, the points of view that we have of him are obviously widely varied, but there was a sense that he was beloved and venerated and held up as this kind of lost ideal returned again. So there there is... I don't know. It's just, it's very interesting. It was something I noticed in the chapter too, where if the Sothran ambitions is, you know, if we take that as, as reasonable, which I think we should, why would he provoke Stark Baratheon and Martell in a single stroke if they were already hoping to, to have a great council and replace his father with him? Like, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm very shaky yeah. on the It describes as there being sort of two camps, the Ares and the Rhaegar camp. It doesn't seem clear to me why anyone would be on the Ares camp. He seems like such a c colossal catastrophe. Um, why not just, dis you know, discreetly get him to... Uh, I guess you can't really get a king to retire, but mm -hmm. you know, just have an unfortunate accident sure. or get, get too sick to continue his duties and then get Rhaegar back in charge and set things right. I can only assume the Andals, some of the Andal lords used him as like a puppet king to get their, their influence across because mm. he was more pliable to, to their demands or whatever. Um, yeah, it doesn't make. Yeah, I mean, we don't know a lot, everything that happened at Harren Hall, but that that did not make a lot of sense. Right. That was really reckless of him. Um, I think. Well, the other thing about demystification is we've probably mythologized Rhaegar to a certain extent, and maybe him and Lyanna were just these dumb teenagers yeah. who didn't think of the uh, the wider consequences of what they were doing. Yeah, Never. or maybe or maybe he's just <laughs> you know uh, saw that Lyanna kind of fit the bill for the uh, for the prophecy. But, but I, I guess the scene is what I'm questioning. Like the, the why go to the trouble if again, I, and then this is a huge lingering if, but if you go to the trouble of arranging this tourney at Heron Hall so that these, you know, Southern ambitioners can all be present in the same, like why make such a catastrophic PR mistake yeah. in on such a concentrated stage? I don't know. It, it nags at me in a way that I don't appreciate, but <laughs> maybe. And it's, it's, it's all speculation. Definitely. I mean, uh, I would have just assume that he values the prophecy higher than he values the political machinations of his uh, realm to mm. a certain extent. Maybe he, he didn't even know that Lyanna was supposed to be like his uh, winter rose, but um, maybe he just found out and then just decided between the two. 
okay, so I have the chance of now like really making a a big entrance and uh, and wooing her uh, now, or I could uh, try to go a bit more sneaky and then uh, save my my face towards the uh, the southern lords. I don't know. Or I could be king and then do whatever the hell I want. Seems like the third option that he's kind of ignoring here. <laughs> like, right. Because Ares suspected Rago was going down there to conspire mm-hmm. with the lords. And then he crashed the party. But why would Rhaegar so obviously disrespect them like mm-hmm. that? Yeah, it doesn't make... I mean, he, maybe he assumed he was unassailable, but then why go down there at all to treat with them? Right, like why yeah. bother to, to have the attorney in the first place? Yeah. So do you think yeah. Rhaegar was the one behind the attorney? The I thought leader. that was the... That he was willing to... I mean, I'm sort of... I, I'm sort of thinking about it in, in parallel terms to the Butterwell marriage in Duncan Egg. Like where, it's definitely a pretext by someone. Yeah. I mean I really think so. And I and I don't know that one can be the subject of the pretext and not at least be aware that there's some pretext happening, right? I, I just think that the mystery night setup is so specific that it's difficult for me to see a way in which it wouldn't be a parallel. But but in that story he was also kind of oblivious. He knew that something was happening and they were they're trying to like treat on his behalf there but he wasn't the the mastermind behind that part either no but he was aware of it i mean you know he had to have been i mean yeah. you, you you could have invited Rhaegar. yeah he could he could have known but he, but then again the targaryens are, are so clueless at this point because they're <laughs> they are they they've been secluded behind the walls for centuries on an end and they I mean even even if Rhaegar went out in the realm and and you know sang for people he might not have known about the the lord's intentions or maybe they just wanted to get him somewhere away from his father so they can actually broach him on the on the subject but then Ares came along and they couldn't necessarily approach him yeah. as, as they wanted to that's, so maybe he wasn't aware of this conspiracy but still though why act like a huge tit in front of you know, like, know. Yeah, Ares. Well, again they're, they're Targaryen <laughs> well, okay, they, can fair enough. They're he's they can do whatever they he's want like, <laughs> yeah he's Rhaegar idiot. genetic predisposition to tittishness mm. yeah so going um, to the next point on how to win thrones and rule people, um, this is this is an interesting one. It basically um, talks about Robert and his strength as a commander and a warrior during this time, which is quite a contrast to, to what we see him now as or in a Game of Thrones. He comes across as very pathetic and incompetent and just not capable of all these supposedly great things that he did 15 years ago. So yeah, they go, he goes through some of the, the, the fates that Robert did, which really helped the war effort. Um, so the first thing, uh, when war was declared, is they needed to take Goldtown, um, so they could send Ned Stark back to the north, and Robert could get to Storm's End. And so in this case, they elected to storm Goldtown, and Robert was apparently the first one on the ladder, and they won, obviously. And this was a key moment because it helped establish some starting momentum for the rebels. And it also just established uh, Robert as like this awesome person to get behind. Yeah, it obviously impressed a lot of them to see him fighting on the battlements. And, you know, a lot of them said that's how a king should fight. So it's a stark contrast to the image they have of Ares as this decrepit, dying king. And then you have this virile sort of leader of men uh, fighting for his cause. And there was a lot of romance about it. You know, he's trying to reclaim his lost love and, and defend his sworn brother, Ned Stark, and free the, the realm of the yoke of Targaryen oppression and all that. I mean, I think, I think that the idea of him being this exceptional commander is not at all at odds with the kind of musty, you know, fat, drunk Robert that we see because, as he himself says, he, he's, I mean, his true skills are left to mold right that he's he's a leader of men not a a counter of coins or whatever it is that he said you know so i I think he he was almost undone by his own success in a lot of ways and if he had continued to be say like a, a fireball or something like that where he's active on the field and he's um you know leading the king's armies or or whatever that that he would have continued to be this kind of paragon of of warrior excellence in a way that he he absolutely wasn't in terms of regality. Yeah, he was good at winning the throne, but not sitting on it. But, or he but was also, too good at sitting on it, maybe. 
yeah. Yeah, but but also his uh, also his his shining qualities, you know, his size and strength and prowess in battle and tactician mind. I mean, we would we assume at least because uh, we don't know if if all of these strategies were actually Robert Aaron and and Ned Stark's ideas, but uh, his prowess in battle, however large they are they sort of just overshadowed all his his bad qualities and i mean that's usually what happens and when you become a man you are the probably the best that you're ever going to be and and if you don't cultivate your your abilities you will end up they will end up decrepifying and the only things that will be left is your bad qualities like his proclivity towards women and drink and they aren't necessarily good qualities or criteria for being a king even though they're obviously very impressive to people on a battlefield and that's kind of the problem i have with people who supported like damon blackfire like oh that's what a king should look like he's fierce and he he fights for what he believes in but that doesn't mean he's going to be good at diplomacy or governance or you know yeah well, <laughs> making taxes or, and all that stuff yeah that was a yeah. that was a counterfactual history question that i had come out of this was if damon blackfire had won the rebellion in the same way that Robert did, like would he have ended up fat and indolent in the same way that Robert did or, or would he have somehow managed to kind of counteract? Yeah. And it seemed like Robert had decent advisors, like John did pretty well, but it, he still couldn't, um, you know, by the time he was gone, the uh, state was in a pretty corrupt position. Well, I mean, sort of corrupt, but just, I, I guess a lot of it is on Robert. He just didn't want to take responsibility. Neglect. So he was left to the yeah. small council to run things. Yeah. Neglect. Yeah. I mean, I, I assume he might have had a finger in it, but it, it makes more sense that that Robert Aaron was just a bad counselor in in, the, in essence, because the 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 amount that Ned tried to do and and and, and sort of succeeded with while Robert was well, he was Robert's hand. Seems like he at least could have gotten Robert to face the realities more easily than than Aaron apparently has failed so catastrophically at. Because uh, three million in debt is is that's a catastrophic failure, no matter how you look at it. What well, six million? Three million six to million. the Lannisters, yeah. one million to the Church, and I think two million to Bravos. Yeah, that that doesn't make it better. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I was just saying that Robert Aaron. I mean, a lot of people we assume that he's a good counselor, but I I see the 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 evidence show to the the opposite more likely that I think he in a uh, financial sense he was pretty crap. Um, mm. I think in everything we don't know everything else, but I just think in being a a solidifying counselor for peace, that's what he did pretty well because he was able to keep Westeros together as a kingdom. Was his the Lannister marriage? That was that was yeah. Aaron, wasn't it? That was his idea. Yeah. Was his idea. Bonus. So, <laughs> so so I would say in all aspects, he he facilitated a marriage between an obviously antagonistic uh, house, and the marriage ended up being horrible uh, mm-hmm. for both parts. He invited Littlefinger to King's Landing. Uh, which uh, ended up being the ruin of the realm plus uh, the ruin of of Ned Stark. Uh, he couldn't have known that specifically, but uh, Littlefinger had had already done stuff that was not good for for the uh, the common people or something mm-hmm. like that. So I mean, he makes a lot of dumb choices for the king, and if he's supposed to be like the king when the king is not there, which Robert wouldn't have been at any point, then he should have been like the one to say this is not happening we need to get the realm in shape but he seems not to have cared or not care enough at least so something else that <laughs> they point out is really good a point in robert's favor is when he gets to storm's end um this is when he's separated from john aaron and ned stark and he has to show some independent thinking and so the fact that he was able to win his win the battle of summer hall it's three different armies at three different times shows that he has some he's capable of coming up with initiative on his own and it's not until he gets to stony sept that he would actually reunite with john aaron and ned and so the fact that he could keep his army going for this long 
I think just also speaks to his yeah his his ability his force of personality that was able to keep this army together, especially after yeah. Ashford after a defeat and apparently mm-hmm. that's really difficult with medieval armies to keep them keep them going after a defeat. And they say that after Summerhall he came out with more soldiers than he started because he was so like impressive and charismatic that a lot of people turned their banners to him and joined their forces to him and. Um, yeah, Ashford was interesting because he's actually venturing into the Reach at that point, while the other, while his other generals uh, amass their forces. And the book sort of talks a bit about the point of that was to have the people that he was attacking lose faith in the Tyrells to protect him and maybe I don't know get them to join with Robert. But it didn't actually work because the Tyrells sent out Tarly and he, he threw him back. Uh, but yeah he seemed to have recovered pretty well from the defeat yeah he couldn't yeah well he decides not to march north to king's landing which i think is obviously a smart decision because his allies weren't ready and if he did that he could have been flanked Mm -hmm. Um, i guess the intention was because he knew that once he left for king's landing storm's end would be open to attack so maybe he was trying to create like outposts or create a bigger buffer between the stormlands and the reach yeah Uh, take uh, flight didn't really work yeah push them back so they didn't weren't able to mobilize as quickly once he marched north Storm's End goes under siege from uh, Mace Tyrell and I think Martin says something that this was it was really important that this castle didn't fall because it there's sort of a comparison to Winterfell falling to the Ironborn mm-hmm. if Storm's End had a fallen it would have like undermined people's confidence in Robert because he wouldn't have had a home or he wouldn't have had his own castle mm-hmm. so it was kind of like a an ideological uh, victory that Stannis was able to hold that yeah, so a couple of people have an idea that like this was Mace sort of hedging his bets, and he was just like, "Oh yes, we're we're this castle is under siege, and we're totally doing something for the time here." <laughs> uh, but Jim McGeehan he says that that's not really the case. Like Mace was actually he was putting effort into bringing this castle down, and his choice to go to Storm's End instead of the Stony Sept, it was obviously the easier thing to do. Um, but it's also important to remember that John Connington, his army was in the field at this point, and he was moving to the Stony Sept. So it was basically a case of, oh, yeah, that's covered. Let's just do this thing that'll give me glory. It was a safe bet, though, because you just you set up the, the towers and the armies and then you just sit down and have a big Just have Aww. feasts every day in front of uh, Stannis. Just like wine and meat wafting over the, over the city walls, yeah. Also, there, <laughs> the is, the castle walls. there is a tradition of... Uh, the lords who capture castles have a say in who gets to sit in them afterwards. So if you if you have, have control of a few castles, you might usually it's when you're in your own land. But if you might be able to seat a cousin or something in there uh, on the behest of the the king, which is probably also why he he went for the larger castle, the more meaningful castle as well. Yeah, and he would have had the glory of capturing Storm's End, which mm-hmm. I don't think has been done. No, it has. Oris Baratheon. Yes. Oris Baratheon takes it, but they sort of surrender to him before he attacks. Mm. Yeah, and in his mind of thinking, you know, the Baratheons, if the Targaryens win, the Baratheons are getting wiped out. And, oh, we need someone to, to live in Storm's End now, you know? So that is, that's actually, yeah, a lot smarter a terrible or idea. ambitious, a lot more he just, ambitious than... He just he just didn't anticipate Stannis's uh, resolve. And Does anyone else think that almost definitely guarantees it wasn't his idea? <laughs> Possibly, yeah. <laughs> Elena, Elena yeah. must have nudged him in that direction. <laughs> Poor Mace. He can't, he can't be that stupid, can he? Oh, I he? don't know. The way he, um, when Kevin's trying to deal with him at the end of A Dance with Dragons, he's just like, he has such contempt in his mind for Mace Terrell. It's just like, holy shit, this guy's an idiot. Well, and even his his side comments in the um, that Tyrion small council that we just looked at the Tyrion chapter, it was just like, oh my god, shut up. <laughs> what are you even saying right now? Yeah, growing up to speak. Yes. <laughs> but of course, yeah, and as we'll get to this in the Patriarchs of Westeros, um, he is the head of the family, so he's entitled to speak, and it, it has to all go through him, whether people like it or not. Yeah, Battle of the Bells. Um, So this is obviously a key turning point in the war. Obviously, if Robert had been found, uh, that could have turned the events against, yeah, the rebellion. Um, I think this is uh, a good example of the role of the commoners in determining the outcome of the war. The fact that Robert was popular and the Targaryens were not, 
probably played a role in that no one gave up where Robert's location was. I mean, I'm sure a lot of them actually didn't know, but the commoners were probably on the side of the rebellion in this case, which greatly hampered John Connington's efforts. Well, the Tridents often held up as the most exciting battle, but this I think this might clinch it, the Battle of the Bells, because there's like so much going on, and the rebels are kind of at their weakest point, because initially they were they were sort of scattering loyalists and taking all these early victories but now the main loyalist army's on the march robert is on the run he's hiding out he's running from house to house they're sort of closing in around him and then on the horizon like the cavalry arrives and it's the first time all the armies are combining the north river run the vale and the uh, stormlands it's like it's very it's very um rohan-esque like lord of the rings yeah, this was certainly the moment where the, the coalition was solidified. And I think uh, Ned and John Aaron, they've either just married Catelyn and Lysa or they were they do it after this. I think they oh. had just I think that's why they were late, right? Because they wanted to make sure that they had Hoster Tully on board before they I thought that's yeah, what it was in yeah. the chapter. Or in so the this, essay. This is kind of where, you know, the rebels are committed, you know, Hoster Tully can't back out now. They're all, mm-hmm. they're all committed to the end. And I think one of the hypotheticals, yeah, as we all know, um, John Connington obviously beats himself up about not being able to catch Robert. And when he goes over to the Narrow Sea and he's telling Miles Toyne, he's like, oh, not even Tywin could have done better. Uh, but then Miles is like, oh, you know what Tywin would have done? He would have just burnt the sept of the <laughs> ground, killed them all, yeah. and finished the war. But this essay actually suggests that that would not have been the the great victory that they all planned because well one of the reasons is that robert's rebellion is only called robert's rebellion kind of retroactively mm-hmm. um to sort of justify it and that there were other reasons that the people were rebelling you know they were pissed about liana they were pissed about the lord stark and the aaron heir who had been taken to king's landing and killed so yeah it doesn't seem like but if they if the rebels had have triumphed, who would they have put on the throne? It would have been a clusterfuck because obviously no one has that nice claim now. But like, it just seems like well, actually, it seems like Ned would have had the firmest claim. Maybe John because he's just like Ned wouldn't want it, and John has more experience with all that. But um, well, aren't the Aarons also Targaryen intermarried? Yep, yeah, two hundred I mean, years were... back. Well, and <laughs> yeah. more so than Stark. Yeah, <laughs> not yeah. vice versa. I think. It's not like uh, there's a Targaryen blood in the Aaron line. I think it's just Aaron blood in the Targaryen line. So ah. I wonder if they could have maybe made a because now once Robert was killed, maybe they could have like made peace with Rhaegar as long as Ares was killed or I don't know because like obviously Robert wouldn't be there beating the drum about killing Rhaegar. Yeah, would have been maybe this would have been when the Great Council was was established if there was mm-hmm. no clear candidate. Oh yeah, that could have yeah that could have maybe worked like a council of the seven kingdoms. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But the point cool. being that it wouldn't have been the great victory that uh, John Connington thinks it was. Um, <clears throat> but on what's important to John Connington and what's going to influence his later chapters is he thinks this is what he should have done. He thinks he should have taken the the fire and blood option. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but the three armies still would have arrived and, and smashed his hopes. Yeah, yeah. So right, but if his if his character, if he's solidified in that sense that what he did wrong was not burning the town to the ground, that doesn't bode well for the Fagon campaign. No. I don't think. Like, yeah, <laughs> he's the like Stormlands are in for some fun. Right, he's like, well, I learned that lesson, you know. And you're like, oh no, <laughs> that's a good insight. Yeah, very serious lesson. Yeah. Yeah, so then the final final stage of this is obviously the battle for the Trident. And this is where you have four Lords Paramount on one side against, what is it, Dawn, the Crown Lands. I think that's it. Who else was fighting for Rhaegar? Did they have many Crown soldiers? They must have, because um, it's mentioned that Rhaegar brought up like 10,000 spears from Dawn. Right. So I'm guessing, yeah, maybe some from the mm-hmm. Riverlands, maybe just drips and drabs, whatever they, wherever they could get it. They also Western. got a lot from. Yeah. They also got a lot from the Stormlands. I mean, almost half of the Stormlands were were supporting uh, Aerys Targaryen. So. Yeah, that's the thing. Like a lot of vassal houses probably didn't go along with their their liege lord. Yeah. I mean, probably like people in the Southern Riverlands who were loyal to the crown. Yeah, the Darys and the stuff. They were loyal to. 
Yeah, and so this is also treated as, again, the final hinge of who wins this battle determines the outcome of the war. Um, but something Jim also points out is that by the time Rhaegar was killed, Jonathan Darry, who was the lieutenant for like the left, Lewin Martell, uh, they had both been killed, and Barristan Selmy had been captured. So even if Rhaegar had killed Robert at this point, they might have won, but it seems that the tide was already turning against the royalist force. Yeah, and also the Lannisters haven't declared yet, so the outcome of the Trident may have informed the Lannisters who they sided with, so they could have sided with Rhaegar if he triumphed. Yeah, possibly, yeah. But I kind of get the sense here that this is the, the tide is definitely favouring the rebels at this point. They've, yeah, they've definitely got the momentum. Like, people are only really half-heartedly fighting for the crown at this point because everyone hates Ares. It's more Rhaegar, I guess, they're fighting for. Whereas the rebels just have this huge surge of, you know, low-level support and they've got the this, like, single goal in mind. Everyone knows the goal and they're all working together towards it. Yeah, and so once Rhaegar's dead, that's it. It's basically over. Was Lyanna already no, dead what? during the Trident? No, because no. Ned finds her alive. Mm. Then she dies. She dies in, like, Ned's arms. Yeah, there's a conversation between uh, Ned and Robert. Uh, Ned said, you offense Lyanna at the Trident, and then Robert said, that did not bring her back, the gods be damned, things like that. So I was thinking, if Lyanna already dead, I know. Sort of posthumous, retroactively yeah. speaking, I guess. Mm. Yeah, like he he had won and she still died. I think is is more yeah. yeah. Well, Robert seems to give up on her before she's actually dead because he doesn't go down to dawn with Ned to try and find her. He's sort of celebrating his victory. So even though she's this constant ghost haunting his dreams, he kind of forgets about her. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't think he forgot about her. I think he already was like chosen resigned to her her death. I think he was chosen to be king already. That the people had arrived at the conclusion that he would end up being king and having a lot of duties uh, around the realm besides from from freeing Diana. I mean, I think that is in, an, in essence, uh, it was just as much Ned's beef with Rhaegar that Lyanna was captured than it was Robert's because Robert might have something like have official business now being king. Ned had to, you know, go in instead. And I guess Ned was also trying to keep it as few people knowing what happened to Leona as possible. So he only brought a, a very trusted host. Yeah, also that. I mean, also, yeah, if, for example, if Robert were to go down there, everybody would know where it was because he's not really the stealthy type. And I guess Ned may have suspected that Leona might have gone willingly. So maybe he was trying to hide that from Robert as well. Oh, Don't interesting. Know. Possibly. I also just guess you need to keep the king in the capital because that looks good. Like if Robert then leaves, it's it appears that the war is still on. Whereas if right, Robert's yeah, sitting that, behind that's the throne, it's true. like oh, he's won. It's it's done. Yeah, time's <laughs> what? You need a sense of clo- you need a sense of closure. Yeah. So we hear about the main battles. We I guess we've got to assume there's a lot of uh, little battles that, that don't get mentioned. One thing I was interested in was the Greyjoys actually attacking the Reach or attacking the Manda. I, I didn't realize they were involved in the rebellion because um, it seemed like Quellen Greyjoy was trying to create more ties to the mainland. Like he was bringing in maesters and he was trying to get rid of reaving and salt wives and all that. Yeah, Quellon didn't seem particularly interested in the war. Um, it was probably the worst thing that could have happened for his plans of, for the Iron Islands. Like he has to go to war now. He has to do shit. Yeah, he was convinced by his eldest sons, actually, um, to join the battle, or else he would not join. And he died with the sea, too. Any more to say on this uh, essay? Uh, Sarah, would you like to tell us about the final essay? Sure. Yeah, let me get my notes here. All right. Um, this is a shocking lack of knowledge. Is it Sasa? Stephen Sasa? Is that how you say his name? Stephen I think Sasa. So. Okay. Sasa, really? Is it? Yes. I, I thought it was Sasa. I don't know. Okay. I, I listened to his uh, oil leather must be boiled once, and I'm almost certain it's Stefan Sasse. Sasse. Okay. Yes. All right, well, apologies to... I'm sure he won't be offended. Mr. Steven. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> okay, so um, this essay provides an overview of the institution of patriarchy in Westeros. The author identifies two possible definitions for the key term. First, a system in which all men are seen as exerting power over women, or as he describes it, one in which all males command authority, 
or a system akin to that of the Roman paterfamilias, in which the authority is centered in one man, the eldest male head of the family. He argues that the latter is the operating system in Westeros is illustrated through the lens of three key patriarchs. First, Tywin Lannister, whom he characterizes as the embodiment of cruelty and ruthlessness, quote, protecting and guiding those under him in their ignorance and innocence. Uh, he also goes into detail on its unfortunate impact on his children. Um, he then turns to Ned Stark as the other end of the extreme, an ideal example reflected in his children, Rob and John, as competent yet relatable, but arguing that he still, like Tywin, retained a very strong sense of up and down, based especially on innate characteristics like gender and class. Finally, he presents Randall Tarley as the example of what happens when you, quote, strip the idea of patriarchy of all of its emotional baggage, um, arguing that Tarley as the head of his family, prioritizes status as defined by warrior prowess and charisma and masculinity as defined by martial achievement and being straight and hard, quote, um, and that he doles out punishments that the author deems cruel and unusual by any standard. Um, he goes on to consider those more in the middle of what he defines as the Tarly Stark spectrum of patriarchy, including Hoster Tully and John Aaron, and finally the Baratheons, none of whom he argues are, quote, particularly patriarchal. He also identifies the Tyrells as a matriarchy, which I think is definitely arguable, and focuses at the end on Dorne, most favorably, as a genderless meritocracy concluding that this is the most optimistic possible model for progress in Westeros. So the most optimistic, optimistic possibility for progression. Yeah. I mean, in a, in the sense that, uh, it doubles your chances of, of getting a ruler, (laughs) right? Exactly. Right. Um, and I think also that it, it takes away the, the initial presumption, which is that in order to be a good ruler, one has to be male. Right. So that, I mean, Cersei is is not a great example of why the pool should be opened a little bit wider, but um, he does he does talk about the the fact that regardless of what could have been Cersei's arguably patriarchal model following strengths from Tywin's perspective were automatically precluded because she was female, um, so that the the sense in Dorne is truly that the elite in a more initially objective sense so charismatic um strong intelligent presumably would automatically rise to the top which i think is somewhat optimistic assessment of how things work in dorn the water gardens notwithstanding but i think the the positive assessment that we have particularly in terms of the sociocultural stratifications based on class comes largely from Doran, and I, I would suggest that maybe his egalitarianism in a philosophical sense is not, does not reflect the kind of practical functioning of Dorn proper, but you know, maybe that's not the case. The, um, the small folk do seem to have, I guess, a lot more patriotism for their, their region than, than other parts, except maybe the North Mm -hmm. because they're, when their prince get killed, there's a big upcry, um, and they seem to be a bit more like rowdy and outspoken to to the point where the the uh, the high lords sort of have to listen to them and listen to what they're saying and and acquiesce sometimes. So there's maybe a, a potentially a bit more of a dialogue between the small folk and the the nobility. I mean, they still they're still operating within a sort of like that traditional idea of a patriarchal structure in terms of the lord at the head of the family can arrange marriages and mm-hmm. tell people what to do and where to go and all that. But I guess at least there's the potential that a, a woman could be at the head of the family and, and operate with that same power. Mm-hmm. And that in turn introduces the idea that the male is not the you know ultimate authority of power and morality mm-hmm. and, and property and all that, those kinds of things. So I, there's definitely, I think there's more um, opportunity there. Um, and you see in the sand sex, I guess, kind of subverting gender roles as a result of that, that different system. Yeah. I mean, I would still argue that a lot of what Duran does, or Doran does, and, and particularly what he does wrong, arguably, is very much approaching things from that kind of father knows best perspective, right? So especially not telling Ariane for so long, like what his actual plan was and things like that. I think that there are still, you know, if we're defining the the non-functional Westerosi brand of patriarchy as that kind of father knows best, like I'm going to guide and and shepherd and um, really not 
have to explain myself unless I'm so inclined. I think that that Dorn is just as guilty of that. At least the Dorn that we see is just as guilty as that, of that as as many of the other. And, and it could even just be a case of the Andel way of doing things influencing Dawn because Ariane does seem nervous of this idea that there's a power imbalance between her and her father and that her he'll pick her brother over her even though he's younger than her mm. so some of those concerns are present um, those kind of patriarchal concerns yeah as you say father knows best mm-hmm. the way he doesn't necessarily let his daughter in on those things but I think I mean you see a change in that because he actually does start to bring her more into his confidence he sees the the damaging effect that's had on their relationship so so, you know, he, he can be possibly going through a bit of a transformation, you know, evolving a little bit. Mm-hmm. I, one of my one of my main questions in reading through this essay was to what extent the first definition of patriarchy, which is to say that the it, that is one in which all males command authority um, can really be separated from the second system. And I, I mean, I think to say that the second system is the only one that's operating in Westeros is a little bit. I don't think he's arguing that. No, I think, I I guess the thing he's talking about is a more formal structure Mm -hmm. of a male head of a household. Um, And in a feudal context, the household, I guess, extends beyond the border of an immediate family to your lands, basically, your peasants, your your soldiers and all that. You're the kind of patriarchal figure of all that. Uh, Whereas, I guess, the other definition is more not so much a formal system, but a series of attitudes mm-hmm. and uh, gender roles and expectations and prejudices that, that affect you know, men and women in, in negative ways. Mm-hmm. That, but I think they probably stem from that more traditional idea. So that maybe the formal structure has been dismantled to a large degree in, in say, a Western society, but a lot of those attitudes still pervade. So I don't uh, think interesting. those attitudes could possibly not be present in, in a society in which the formal structure still exists. Like, I think you see that, you know, that kind of misogyny and that kind of prejudice violently um, expressed in the narrative. Yeah, I was just, I was surprised by the claim that the essay would use the latter definition as, of patriarchy. I mean, and, you know, as you say, like, I think that one is an attitude and one is a sociopolitical system and, and that to discuss the sociopolitics, you have to use the latter definition. But yeah, I mean, I, I just, it seemed then in the subsequent discussion to be limited to those fathers and not sort of the sons and the farmer who <laughs> is, has control of his wife. Like it just, there was less of a trickle down sense of this paterfamilias mindset than I had expected initially from the way that the discussion was set up, I think. Yeah, I think he was just limiting his scope to that more traditional definition. Mm -hmm. But but I think what Martin does really well is actually give subject, even though he acknowledges and he he crafts a world which is extremely sexist and ordered in that way, he gives fairly even subjectivity to men and women so you get different perspectives Mm -hmm. and how it affects people and how some people operate within those roles and and how some people um, fight against them Mm -hmm. and the, the, the punishment they receive for trying to fight against them. Um, so then my second question was, to what extent can patriarchy of either type really be separated in this sociocultural system from feudalism? And like how you can really say it's it's patriarchy that's the problem simply because the Lord's Paramount or the Bannermen or the, you know, the sort of the, the liege lords and then all of those on down through the system are male by definition. Like, is the problem in terms of static culture and a lack of potential for progress truly that there's a pyramid scheme and the person at the top of the pyramid is male necessarily or is it the pyramid scheme itself you see what i'm saying like yeah even if pyramid scheme or just having the single centralized power through these very few amounts of people Mm mm-hmm Otherwise, it's, it gets into men are evil and men destroy the world. Well, I mean, yeah, and I, I was sort of, I mean, I, I think that that is the system that's in place. But I think to say, to hold, and then this is sort of speaking to the point that I was making earlier, to hold Dorn up as the antidote to that, I think is is overly optimistic in terms of limiting it purely to a gender issue, right? I think if you eliminate that, like if Jenna Lannister were the head of the Lannisters, like, would her small folk be any better off? I mean, it, you know, I mean, I mean, obviously she seems more sort of pragmatic and reasonable than some of the other Lannisters just in general, but I just, I hesitated to sort of get totally on board with the idea that like it's the patriarch part of patriarchy that is, that's the issue, even though those were his, his key examples because it is so intimately tied into this, um, the stratification by class as well. 
Um, and then it is sort of a third branch to the same line of inquiry. Um, if the Baratheons who are functioning until Stannis as a, or until Renly, I guess, as a, as a strictly primogenitorial system, just like everyone else, that they're the Lord's paramount of this area. Um, if they aren't patriarchal because, for example, of Robert's sort of laissez-faire attitude, as, as the article suggests, um, is patriarchy, even as it's discussed in here, working as an attitude or as a system? Like, because I don't, if you're, if you're taking the purely political definition of patriarchy, I don't know that you could really argue that Robert isn't patriarchal unless you are also defining it as an attitude. And I, I don't know. It was just, it was like a, a very slippery, um, slippery application like, I of think this term, I think, in a lot of the discussion. But I think fatherhood or father figure might have been a better term to work with. Like the idea that Robert fails in his fatherly duties, well, he neglects his not children. The, not the first one. He obviously, <laughs> okay. he obviously still demonstrates very patriarchal attitudes mm-hmm. towards women and soldiers and just the way he acts, yeah. the way he's entitled to things. It was just, it was very interesting to me to, to have them set aside as a counter example to this sort of patriarchal system because in so many ways they do resemble it. And if it's, if it is that kind of hands-off approach that disqualifies one as a patriarch, that it's, it, it almost read to me as though like, like a kind of patronizing condescension <laughs> were a necessary part of being a patriarch, which I, you know, where you kind of, it, again, that father's father knows best attitude. It's it just, it was interesting to me that the way that he was distinguishing between like Ned as yes, but, not bad and then Robert is no but kind of and um, I don't know the the stratifications or, or the kind of spectrum that he established was very interesting to me because it did seem to slip between you know pure authority and and this kind of again this paterfamilias idea versus like the attitude with which you took to that which I think speaks a lot to what we were saying about the Machiavellianism where do you have to be a Machiavell to be a patriarch or or <laughs> Yeah, but I guess the attitude is so ingrained that it's not even identified. It's just the way things are. It's only after some of those formal systems have have been dismantled that you realize, oh, there's all these attitudes and behaviors that go along with that. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think as the as the novels go on, what's interesting is a lot of these big figures that loom so so large over over the characters like Ned, like Tywin. After they die, it's it's interesting the way the realm and their children respond to that. So it is like the death of the father figures, and there's a big break, and it's these children who don't know how to deal with the world, and and, and there's there's a gap there. Well, I, I mean, I think it's yeah, I think maybe what you're suggesting is that the almost the absence of this this head of family is what's more important than um, at least in the narrative as we have it than than. Uh, we went from having, you know, too many fathers to having not enough and nobody really knows what to do. Right, yeah. And how the, the missing mother figure isn't nearly talked about as much because, I get, at least in the Lannister children, for example, mm-hmm. they're always comparing themselves to their father, but the mother is always, it's almost deliberately not spoken of. Like, it's something, at least for, Ty- for Tyrion, it's this shameful memory that he killed his mother and, and Jamie has that famous dream of her in, like, one of his last chapters... And she's like, have you forgotten me? I wonder if you knew your father as he really was. Or mm-hmm. that, this idea of like broken family seems really important to the to the narrative. Yeah. And that broken roles and people not knowing how to act and trying to emulate their fathers and failing at it. And, yeah. It's also just a problem that George has with the, the Dead Bums Club. <laughs> the Dead Bums Club. Something that's been pointed out is George has a penchant for killing the mums off, usually through childbirth, so he can get that broken family dynamic. I mean, I, I, to be fair to George, though, I feel like the Middle Ages also had a penchant for killing the moms off. So, like, usually through childbirth. So, it's a mid- <laughs> middle-aged trope. Yeah, exactly. It's just a, you know. And also, yeah. he's a, and also he's a writer from eight, the eighties, which also had propensity to like uh, kill off the mom or divorce the mom or something like that because of the age of divorce happening there so there might also have been right, uh, yeah. it just his style stems from there well i just i mean i don't even think you have to to necessarily attribute it to authorial baggage even <laughs> it's just to say you know that this is such a such a rigid system i mean to to kind of pull in the imagery from one of our other chapters it's such an iron system right that like when it's functioning it does seem ironclad and then as soon as you look more closely, there are so many places where if if one piece slips a little bit, 
the whole thing so easily comes crashing. I mean, so any father at the head of the family or, you know, any kind of secondary, like if there's no heir, right, then chaos erupts. Or if there's, um, you know, if the mother is missing and the the cruelty of the patriarch is unbalanced in the way that it becomes with Tywin after Joanna dies. Yeah, but I just that's a good point. It, it, it shows the fragility of the system if someone doesn't play their role correctly or if something goes wrong, if there's a piece missing, mm-hmm. it all starts to crumble and it has to defend itself violently if necessary. Like Jamie does not expose that fragility. Jamie taking the white cloak, right? I mean, like that that single handedly, you know, decimated the future of House Lannister without even. Right, yeah, <laughs> and they can't deal. They can't deal with it facing the problems with this system, so they have to find a way to put it back right, and they and they never can. Yeah, at least yeah. this huge question mark hanging over. Um, what happens when you die, Tywin? <laughs> it was never answered. Yeah. Or what happens when Stannis dies? Yeah. Well, yeah, there is like precedence for if you, there's no other situation and stuff like that. But to get back to the the reasons why George George might have read, written it like this. I mean, yeah, I mean, Sarah, you, you definitely assume that that George has put in so so much thought into all the dynamics between all the families, and and specifically chosen to not have moms for, for the reason to expose the the faults of the patri- patriarchy or the the fluidness of it. I just I just go by the uh, assumption that he some of these things he does is subconscious rather than uh, conscious choices and yeah no I, I i'm very i'm very much not a proponent of the authorial intent argument in any kind of analytical reading of a time I mean, i just think that the greatest authors are the ones that do the most profound things without intending to <laughs> um yeah. but i i mean i think yeah that, that there are um sort of patterns that are revealed in making those choices not as to why they were made but as to the the kind of fallout from making them that's just uh any thoughts on the tyrells is this like more matriarchal system as a as an opposing uh, idea to to the patriarchy i wouldn't classify them as a matriarchy um i'd say it's like the females are active and are doing a lot of the work but mace Tyrell is always on top and that's mm-hmm. how it will always be and when he dies, it goes to Willis. And so, yeah, I, I just have trouble calling that a, a matriarchy. Well, I think, yeah, I, I mean, I think it's it's similar to my qualification of the Dorn assessment that even if there are underlying dynamics that are different, that Elena is influential or that, as the article points out, that, um, or as the chapter points out, that Wyless writes to Marjorie when... I think it's when the Iron Islands attack that there there's no illusion under which they are openly the the leaders of the house. Like I, I just think, yeah, to call it a matriarchy is um, maybe in practice, but certainly not nominally and and certainly not conceptually. I think. Yeah, it's a way of dealing with a a, a failing a, a fault in the patriarchy uh, rather than actually being a matriarchy. Yeah, it's like right. it's a compensatory mechanism yeah rather yeah. than a, a and an overhaul of the system or an alternative system i think mm. um that it's a it's a backstop rather than a um any kind of reformation yeah mm. for sure the tyrells do seem to work much better as a family though like the kids seem much happier things seem mm-hmm. to be more ordered and more uh, pacified and i don't know everyone seems okay in their roles that they're playing like the I guess Mace maybe doesn't realize how much he's being manipulated, <laughs> but like he seems to respect Olena's authority or her kind of uh, grandmotherly authority. But I don't know. Like Olena seems to be playing it pretty well, the way she's um, situating things. But I guess we don't really get a POV into the Tyrells, so we don't know if it's all as perfect on the inside. Well, I think one of the big distinctions with them, at least from what we've been able to gather, is that they share information much more freely among themselves. Um, Whereas, you know, sort of what I was saying about Doran and then also obviously about Tywin, where he's like, I'm only going to tell you this is a need to know basis. And you rarely ever need to know unless I decide that you do for some reason. And I think that that is not the sense that I have of the Tyrells, that they they do kind of collectively 
assess situations and, you know, that, that Marjorie isn't just left to believe that she's marrying a monster and get over it. You know what I mean? Like that, that she has at least a, a sense of confidence that her family won't just hand her over and, and forget about her, you know, which is something that Cersei certainly didn't have with Robert. So, um, just, yeah, like communication maybe is the, is the, yeah, it, it seems more like a team. Mm-hmm than the uh, Lannisters where it's, you know, father knows best mm-hmm. to do what I say. I know how best to run this family, whereas especially Alana and Marjorie, the way they, that she's sort of grooming her and she's the protege and, and um, everyone has a, a talent that they, they use. Mm-hmm. Um, Loris is good for wielding <laughs> and throwing metal forces, so that's what he does. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting yeah, like the relationship yeah. between Olena and Marjorie, and if you might compare that to Cersei and maybe Jenna. Like, we don't really know what role Jenna had other than those two times she spoke to Cersei. But, like, yeah, it seems like something like that didn't happen in the Lannister house. No. That mm-hmm. support network for Cersei. In fact, yeah, she really didn't get to talk to that many females scenes. Or oh, actually, no, she killed them. She keeps killing them and sending them. Yeah. I guess that's her. Yeah, never yeah. mind. Yeah. Kind of puts it. Like, well, there was that one in the, the well, but the conversation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bit one-sided. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he refers to sort of three examples: Tywin, Ned, and Tali. We sort of talked about Ned and Tywin. Any thoughts on Tali? It's a kind of uh, the sheer cruel father figure. He just seems like the patriarchal scarecrow to me. Like, I just I feel like we don't. I mean, obviously we know how he treated Sam and it's appalling, but I think in terms of the systemic functioning that it's just, I don't know. I mean, maybe the characterization that, that the author gives that you, sh- the, you he's what you get when you strip the idea of patriarchy of all its emotional baggage. So you're almost seeing it kind of secondhand at a distance. And like, this is what every patriarch could potentially look like where you're, you're sort of a, a demigod on high, just dispensing justice at what appears to be your whim. But I thought I was surprised at the at him as the third of three in this particular essay. Like I, I was surprised to see him so prominently featured, although he is obviously an example of the very dictatorial extremity to which the system can easily be. And he, he's probably the example where gender plays the biggest role in terms of him having this specific image of what a man should be. Mm. It's just like cold, stoic, hard, violent. Uh, robot person mm-hmm. if you don't embody that you're somehow shaming or going against the system mm-hmm. you know there's only it's it's a very uh, harsh idea of what what people can be if you don't embody this role mm-hmm. you're dead to me um so he's definitely the sort of most toxic idea of what a patriarch could be yeah yeah absolutely yeah my father knows best and you're not it <laughs> also right yeah exactly yeah. also in a literary sense he might have been put in to show that Tywin, even though he does suck, uh, you can go further in the ah, Patreon. Ah, that's very interesting. To sort of yeah. to humanize maybe Tywin for a little bit so that we don't hate him automatically when he appears. It's just, that, that's very interesting, yeah. But I, I mean, it, to, again, to go back to our, our Machiavellian discussion, I feel like it's fascinating to, to recognize that if he is functioning on one hand as that extreme foil to anyone that we might think was too patriarchal <laughs> i mean like he's the worst case scenario but he's also widely regarded as the best general and and the most successful and the sort of paragon of what i think the author describes as um like the blackfire ideal right where it's the warrior ruler kind of and it's it's just interesting to think that like he would be so appallingly extreme but that also in that extremity he's living up to um some of the the greatest ideals that we've seen this world valuing because of yeah that's right if you if you take some of the things that robert was glorified for and, and take him to a more extreme version you see the the uh the poison poisonous toll they can take mm-hmm. okay uh we might wrap it up then um so that concludes our discussion of a hymn to spring We've covered four of, uh, I think it's 11 essays um, in the book. Uh, So let us know if you'd be interested in a follow-up podcast. Uh, I'd like to thank our hosts for this evening, uh, which are Silvana, Michael, Sarah, and Patrick. This has been the Vassals of Kingsgrave. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time. Yay. Bye. Bye. Yay. Bye. (laughs)